Hey there, comic book friends. I'm Travis, and it's time for their comic book roundtable. And I am here by myself today. Um, other people had other commitments. Traveling across the country, out of town, broken computers, whatever the case may be. It's leaving it just me tonight, which is okay. We'll see just how long I can talk. Um, it is 6.36 specific time here where I am at. It is still 105 degrees Fahrenheit outside. Um, that is extremely hot. <laughs> so uh, I have been hiding in my cool basement, but um, we're gonna talk some comics. Let's talk some comics. Let's talk, huh, what do I, what do I wanna talk about first, Travis? Well, let's, let's, let's talk Marvel books first. Um, so I only picked up two Marvel books this week. I picked up, um, uh, uh, Loki, Agent of Asgard, uh, issue 15. This is the last days of um, Secret Wars tie-in. Entertaining. Um, this um, issue, we get kind of a background story of Verdi, um, our main Loki, because there's multiple Lokis in this book. Uh, the main Loki character, um, like his, now her, because Loki is now a female, uh, best friend. And um, so it's mostly a spattering of a smattering of her story to find out how she gets her powers. Um, it has a little bit of um, Civil War um, tie-in in it. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Civil War is where um, Iron Man and his group of people um, and the government decide that they need to register all the superheroes, right? That's Civil War. I, if I remember correctly, I actually wasn't reading comics during the Civil War thing, so... I haven't picked that up yet, but anyway, pretty sure that's what it was. So for the whole civil war um, thing, you know, Verdi was around then and, and signed up and she goes through a couple jobs, which is kind of interesting, that sort of stuff. Um, and um, yeah, kind of interesting twist at the end of this. Um, Evil King Loki, of course, is in Asgard, um, uh, destroying the Asgardians um, along with the help of hell and the underworld. The idea being if they destroy Asgard, um, they can break off the 10 realms. So there'll just be nine realms. So they'll be separated from um, Midgard, from Earth, um, because Earth is where the whole Secret Wars disaster is happening now, where the worlds are colliding. And they feel like if they sever those ties, that they won't be involved in, in the destruction of the universe. They'll be kind of on the outside, not attached to um, all the Earths crashing into each other. Um, so de decent, um, story. This one wasn't as gripping or, or have as many, uh, like emotional pulls in it, um, for me, but, um, still, uh, really enjoying it. Curious to see how long the Loki of Asgard, Asgard goes on. It, um, um, you know, definitely at least has another issue to it. I haven't looked at the advanced solicitations for this to know how far out, uh, before it suddenly isn't around anymore. Um, but still, still really enjoying it. Um, a book I think that has ended um, is Uncanny Avengers, issue number five. Five issues in, and I think Secret Wars is going to be the end of this. Um, cover art by somebody different. Um, it's not it's not uh, Akuna is doing the art on the inside, which is amazing art on the inside. We get our final fight with um, um, Oh, horrible. I know his name until I start talking about this darn book, and then I always forget what his name is. Um, uh, the Evolutionary. Um, the High Evolutionary. Yeah, the High Evolutionary. And um, they get a final battle with him, which I think was interesting. You get to see a little more of High Evolutionary. I don't know a lot about the character, um, so I, I enjoyed this, getting get to get that exposure. Um some aspects of this get tied up pretty quick and pretty neatly. Um, it feels like that this, you know, part of what this whole story was, was to cement that clearly Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver are not mutants. Um, and I'll talk more about them, the fact that they're not mutants here in a little bit when it comes to uh, Marvel News. Um, but it does feel like it's more part of the whole move things away from mutants that they don't have to have be mutants. So... Um, they don't have to deal with the Fox stuff. That's the cynical side of it to me. 
uh, about it. Um, but we get the end of the story. The end of the story says the end, and it says there is only secret wars. Um, this book clearly is delayed because the ad in it is for Secret Wars issue one, and clearly Secret Wars issue one has been out for a while now because we're on like issue three of Secret Wars, I believe. Um, I really did enjoy this. I like I like the makeup of the characters that were this that were this group. I would have liked to have seen more of that. Um, you know, so we're left with seemingly after this whole thing is done, uh, Quicksilver is lost. Um, Scarlet Witch can't find him with regards to the magic that she uses. Um, it looks like um, it looks like Sabretooth is the equivalent of old man Sabretooth. He has been aged and nothing fixes him back. Um, the last we see of him, he is an old man still. So that'll be curious to see what goes on with that. But I don't know. I didn't. I haven't seen solicitations for this book. Some great art in here. I haven't seen solicitations for this book. Um, so I don't know if there is any more. And I don't know that it's coming back. You know, I don't know that it's coming back after, you know, after it's all said and done. Because I know that from what I've seen, the all new, 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 all new, extra new uh, Avengers, um, like the visions in that group, uh, I think this, this version of Captain America um, is is in that group also. I, I could be wrong on that part. So I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I don't know exactly that this is gonna, there's anything left of it. I really liked this creative team and I, I liked the idea of what they could have done with this. But it really feels like this was mostly just a story to, for you know, a corporate story to cement um, two more mutant characters that now they're not mutants. Um, they've been uh, described as something else now. They're they're leftovers of the high evolutionary. The high evolutionary created them and basically cast them back to Earth because they were they weren't worthy. Um, and that's my Marvel books, which then leads me to the Marvel news. I don't know if it's news or anything, but looking over some articles and stuff, um, uh, Mr. CDC on Twitter, uh, comic to comics uh, here on YouTube. Um, he directed me to an article where guys talking about the fact that right now you, you can go to um, like Walmart and buy Secret Wars shirts, the old, the old Secret Wars shirts from the original Secret War uh, event um, back in the 80s. And they've altered the art on the Secret Wars shirts. Um, there is no more Fantastic Four. Fantastic Four has been removed. And there are people like Black Panther and stuff like that have been put in their place. And, and Power Man and Iron Fist have been put in their place. Um, same with, the, um, same with the, the mutants on it. They're, they're gone. They're, they're not on any other licensed product anymore. So is that pure coincidence? Um, um, Barut, Tom Barut is of course saying, oh, that, that bloggers and stuff like that are just stirring the shit. We're just making stuff up and, and creating something that doesn't really exist. Uh, clearly Marvel is not doing any of that stuff, whatever. But what's the justification then for, for taking an original piece of art, that original cover of the um, of Secret Wars, you know, all those great heroes, um, you know, flashing out there that, you know, great cover and then pulling um, all the Fantastic Four and stuff off of it and, and replacing them with, you know, other random characters kind of in the same position and whatnot. Um, I don't, I don't see what the, what the rationale for that would be other than clearly it feels like they're still moving away from anything that Fox might have a, a, a grasp on also because they don't want to promote anybody else's, you know, anybody else's work or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, you know, whatever, I, I guess. Um, and of course that also lends to the fact that I'm, I'm still curious because I haven't heard anything differently and I'm still hearing that the intention is, is after secret wars that all the mutants are going to have to leave earth because um, they can't stay on earth because the, um, the tetraging or however you say it, gas that turns in humans to inhumans is somehow become poisonous to, um, to mutants. And so they're going to have to move off planet. So it's all going to be mutants in space, X-Men in space or, or whatever. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't, that one, I still have a hard time grasping if they actually do that and whatnot. But, uh, you know, I guess, you know, their property, they can do what they want to with it. I, as a fan, I think that's unfortunate. Um, it's unfortunate as a fan that our, our comic books are being railroaded by, um, 
um, railroaded by by the movies. The movies and the corporate end of it is really pushing um, um, where where our characters are going creatively, as opposed to these would be interesting stories. Let's tell some interesting stories. Um, and I'm not even sure they're doing a very good job of. Okay, this is where the character needs to go to, so let's tell an interesting story to get them there. The the Uncanny Avengers kind of was that way. Um, it just feels like there needs to be more now uh, than than just simply saying, "Oh, they're they're not mutants and the high evolutionary." They kind of wet our whistles on that, and then not you know, not completely came through on it. So that's that's um, an, an unfortunate. I think um, had a conversation earlier. Um, I mean, what the Fugue video talking about the fact that. Um, that you know this whole you know who's going to be spy you know they just announced a new actor being you know hired as spider-man and and you know should we have a miles morales spider-man movie as opposed to a peter piker spider-man movie which clearly is not going to happen um you know and there was definitely some sentiment among that conversation of you know basically screw the movies i hope they all fail at this point so then that way we can go back to just enjoying our comic books and and they won't have that level of corporate influence, even though they clearly have always had a level of corporate influence on it. So, um, so anyway, looking at our comments here real quick, see if I cut anything. Um, so Christina is telling me she believes the last issue of Loki is issue um, number 17, though she's not sure. So two more issues we, we've got of, of Loki. So that'll be, um, yeah. So, and, and, and Luke is here in comments. He says, greetings from Virginia. Um, yeah. So looking forward to chatting books next week. That's awesome. You'll have your internet. So we'll have, we'll have Luke back next week. We'll have a talk, Luke, about next week. Because um, next week, of course, um, next Saturday, I believe, is um, here in America. It's, you know, blow your neighbor up um, day with fireworks and stuff. So 4th of July, I'm not sure we're having a roundtable on Saturday. Maybe we'll squeeze it in on Friday. I can get my books and get them read fast enough. Anyway, Ryan's saying the last room I heard that the FF and X-Men and all other mutants will either be shipped off to the past via time travel or put on another planet after Secret Wars is over. Ugh. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know. To me, that just seems, that seems crazy to do that. Um, to to um you know ship them off let's see what else i got for comments here spending them from the rest of the new marvel universe proper oh, okay well that'll be um that will be interesting to to say the least um so i don't, I don't know it'll it's gonna be whatever it is right um I don't know. <laughs> uh, to me, that seems worse than, than than a lot of stuff like the DC doing their hard reboot and whatnot. To, to me, that seems um, um, seems seems nuts. So I, I don't know what that what that's gonna be like. So, um, okay, so, you know, your comments. Um, I, I don't, can't think of any other Marvel news right offhand um, besides just that kind of whole thing with the, with the merchandising and the moving mutants off of, and the Fantastic Four off of their um, merchandising elements and whatnot. Um, seems really wrong about the Fantastic Four, just thinking off the top of my head. If they're gonna move the Fantastic Four off to like another planet or throw them back in time, well, maybe back in time, but throwing them off on another planet and whatnot, that just doesn't work for Fantastic Four, does it? Um, at least I haven't. I mean, I'm not a big Fantastic Four fan. I've tried Fantastic Four a couple times, but it seems to me like if you move them off into space, whatever, those are the stories that I've tried and have not enjoyed, uh, have not enjoyed any of those. Um, the cosmic story, I guess. And maybe I'm just reading the wrong ones. I, I don't know. Anyway, we're going to move on. Let's move on to DC. We'll talk about the DC books that I got. Um, let's go with... Let's hit the number ones first, shall we? Um, Justice League 3001, issue number one, which basically takes off right after Justice League 3000. Um, 
it's set somewhat in the future, clearly, because it's 3001 as opposed to 3000. Uh, mostly the same cast of characters. Time has gone by. They In the last arc, they end up with a battle against um, against evil Cadmus and against Etricate. Uh, they win both cases, um, and now they've established themselves, and they're moving forward, uh, being the superheroes that they are. Um, we find out in this issue that um, um, kind of like they're the, the brains of the group, uh, the person that came up with the idea of creating these... Um, reincarnated versions of the Justice League. Um, Ariel has been supplanted um, by the evil Lois Lane. Evil Lois Lane is controlling Ariel and she is trying to um, destroy the Justice League from the inside by sending them out to do impossible missions, but somehow they succeed at, at, at regardless of whether this will be impossible or not. Uh, they get sent to a planet that is controlled by, legally, legally controlled by Starro and Starro has, mutil has, has butchered a whole bunch of um, citizens who didn't have stars in their faces that were trying to overthrow Starro. Um, it's a legal sanctioned kill because of some legal technical stuff on there, and the Justice League's trying to figure out how to deal with that. They send, uh, one of the funny things is they send Guy Gardner off to this planet to um, do some research. And of course, anybody who knows Guy, Guy Gardner, Guy Gardner's not the best person to send out to do you know, research, you know, he's a, he's a muscle head. The extra funny thing is, is that um, when they reincarnated Guy, Guy Gardner, Green Lantern, they put him in a woman's body. So you kind of get this kind of, it's somewhat comical, but not in poor taste, I don't think. Um, this whole kind of transgender thing where Batman's like going, Guy Gardner's a she now, don't refer to him as a he. And then of course, you know, the other people are saying, well, he's a he regardless of what body he's, he's, well, what body, no, Batman's the other way around. Batman's, he's a he regardless. And some of them are saying she's a she because she's in a she's body. And Batman's like, no, you don't understand. If you feel like you're a guy, even in a girl's body, you're a guy. Anyway, it, it's amusing. The whole thing's kind of funny. Um, meanwhile, while they're trying to figure out how to deal with the Starro's, I love Starro. Uh, Starro's one of those super villains I just love because it's just this, I don't know, like ridiculous in the, the what they can get into and stuff. And I like seeing people run around with a big giant, you know, purplish blue star stuck to their face, I guess. Um, meanwhile, while they're doing that, fire and ice are back on the equivalent of what was once Earth. It's not called Earth anymore, the prison planet. They're trying to rehab that planet and get it back to being what Earth used to be. They're trying to find um, Blue Beetle and Booster Gold, who are the original Blue Beetle and Booster Gold because they had been frozen in time all this time cryogenically prison had been thought out. So they're, they're, they're looking for them. They're going to team up with them, kind of be like the equivalent of Justice League International. And they're going to um, see if they can fix Earth, put Earth back the way it is. And they're hoping that the, uh, that Booster Gold and Blue Beetle aren't the dorks that they always were. But of course they're going to be because they haven't changed. There hasn't been hundreds of years for them it's simply been a, a really long sleep. So a fun book. I love the artwork. Um, um, Howard Porter it does great artwork and um, Geffen and DeMatteis just do really well at, at kind of a tongue in cheek uh, kind of a story. So it's just a fun, laughable um, story. So I, I do I do like it because of that. Um, I check the comments again here quick. We have a lot more of that this time around just because um, um, because you guys are the ones I have to talk to. I don't have myself to talk to. Let's see here. Right, Ryan's talking about the space thing. Fantastic Four went out to space for Fractions Run. It sucked. I agree. I did not enjoy it at all. Leaving the FF team on Earth, which was lots of fun, which I also agree with. That's definitely the case. Okay. Um, we are Robin. Not Robins. We are Robin, number one. Uh, great cover. Um, this is written by... Um, 
Primero, Primero, Primero. Um, same guy who does Suiciders, does the art and writing in Suiciders, which I will talk about later on. Um, art by um, Corando, Roundoff, and um, Muthville. I'm, um, I don't know what I think of this book. I wasn't terribly excited. I, I was excited for it to be something. Uh, this first issue didn't really grab me. Um, I'm not that interested in our what I'm assuming is our main protagonist in the, in the book, our main character. Um, yeah, I'm supposed to feel sorry for him because he, he's currently orphaned because this is just after the whole um, um, end game stuff in the Batman book. Uh, clearly um, Gotham was really screwed up by the Joker um, stuff that was going on. And he, the main character's parents were lost. Um, and so he's kind of an orphan. He's going to foster homes uh and he's wearing cologne that gets him in all kinds of trouble um the whole cologne thing i don't i i, I don't know whatever um so yeah i mean I'm, I'm committed for at least three issues on the book you know so i will get it for that but unless like issue two really ramps up and gets really exciting i'm i'm just not that interested it didn't grab me there, there was nothing really you know it's a group of kids that have kind of gathered themselves together and they're going to snatch up this um snatch up our main character and they basically are all calling themselves robins and they're after this main character because he actually came into contact with batman uh batman saved him at one point and and so um that makes him extra cool with the rest of the robin kids i guess uh, but they all wear an array of different clothing that's in robin colors with ours on it um but wasn't wasn't really all that impressed with it i, I mean i wasn't it didn't um wow me or really intrigue me or make me go boy i'm really excited to see what happens next it seems relatively mundane as far as superhero starting not comic book um so maybe just not for me i don't know but i wasn't i wasn't in, incredibly gripped by it um and I, I don't know that i heard a lot of people talk a lot about it um, so curious what other people think of the book, um, but yeah, wasn't wasn't all that special for me. Book that is really special, not a number one. Um, Grayson issue number nine, starting of a new arc, starting of the whole. Okay, Spiral's been taken down. At least that the the person who was in charge of Spiral has been taken down. New era is beginning here. Um, new people in charge of of spiral let's see what happens starts right out with um dick grayson um trying to get a hold of batman to go okay now that the main goal of of shutting down the crazy guy that was in charge of spiral is done what am i to do next but he gets zero response because of course to the best of our knowledge bruce lane and batman is deceased or at least not answering the radio call so there's a little bit of desperation there as far as that goes. Um, and then we go on, the, we'll go on the story. The story now is they're doing their typical spy missions that they do and whatnot. Um, now their focus has become um, more along the lines of we're going to, you know, take out the bad things before the bad things become bad things. I'm trying to remember what exactly the quote is. I'm going to bump the book here and see if I can find it real quick to, find, to tell you what their kind of their new their new um their new motto is but um really like the book uh the art continues by janin uh continues to be uh, amazing he does a very good job of drawing um you know beautiful people and of course uh, dick grayson clearly is a um you know a beautiful person um so and you know they do a little bit of fan service in here by making him out to be handsome um, making him ask the question, am I straight? He's talking about his tie and whatnot, but it's just kind of funny how it plays out. Um, like I said, some gorgeous um, two-page splashes of people dancing, Dick and a, a duchess dancing, which is really cool. Um, yeah. Um, and now that I've said that, I'm not going to be able to find, I'm not going to be able to find the quote that says what they're, now that Minos is dead, what their goal is. But the the real story is, is somebody has been following along behind 
spirals missions this whole time that Dick's been with him and has been killing off these secondary agents. There, there are lots of spy agencies out there like Checkmate and, and some of these other spy agencies. And they'll be kind of in on whatever it is that, or they're trying to steal the same information the spiral is stealing. And in the past, every time one of these things has been done, after Grayson has left or whatever, the spies are being beat to death with trenches, which is kind of a Nightwing thing, right? Um, but not being beat to death. So it kind of leads people to think that, hmm, that maybe this Grayson guy is actually some sort of, some sort of worse, um, you know, rogue agent that he's, you know, he's out there beating people to death. And so they're trying to figure that out because the rest of the spy agencies have basically told, um, here they are staying in the background, the other representatives of the other spy agencies, basically tell them, you either fix this or we're going to fix it for you. And their version of fix it for you is basically attempt to wipe spiral off the, off the planet. So, um, and, and, and to stop a, a, um, a a war you know basically so I'm still trying to find that stinking thing what it says where it says what the um cannot find it though oh well i liked um i liked what it um Oh, um, Matron is so fond of reminding us Spiral protects the secrets that the that protect the world. So they're going out of their way to protect the secrets that protect the world. And in this case, the mission they're doing in this particular issue is the Duchess, unbeknownst to her, she has a slice of um, uh, Kryptonian crystal. It's part of a necklace that she has. And anybody who gets a hold of that crystal can then use it against Superman. So they're going to acquire that secret acquire the crystal to protect Superman basically because Superman protects the world it is the idea. Uh, Grace is just a really slick book. Um, it's smart. It's funny. Um, it's pretty as all heck. Um, I I've been really surprised. I'm yeah, I tell you the truth, not really a much of a Dick Grayson fan as a whole. Um, you know, I read quite a bit of the Nightwing run and I didn't care for it that much. Really, really, really liking this book. It's a, it's a, just a fun, strong book the right amount of action the right amount of you know tongue-in-cheek kind of cute humor in it um the right mix of a lot of stuff so i've just been really really been enjoying it um got them by midnight um issue number six new creative team great cover by bill sekowicz here um uh the new artist on it is um ferrera uh, does the new interiors instead of Ben Templesmith? I, I think his artwork's fine for this. Um, you know, he is a horror style um, um, type of a um, uh, of artist. Um, he he did Colder or has been doing Colder for um, Dark Horse. So clearly that you know that the creepy and tentacled and bump in the night sort of stuff is, is something that he is used to doing. Um, he doesn't. You know, does a fine job in this. I I, I think it's in uh, capable hands artistically. Um, uh, a fine story in this issue uh, going forward, trying to recover from um, the specter coming out and almost consuming all of Gotham. Um, the consequences of that being that we lose um, Sister uh, Justine, which I think is a bummer. I thought that was an interesting character. I wanted to kind of see more of the nun. Um, the upside to this issue is we get Kate Spencer introduced into the DC universe again. Uh, for people who don't know, Kate Spencer was the last version of um, Manhunter. Um, she started out as a um, uh, prosecuting attorney in, in LA who also um, worked as a vigilante. Uh, the people that she couldn't try and prosecute because they would get off on whatever technicality, but were clearly murderers, them murderers and horrible people. She would then hunt them down and try to execute them <laughs> at night. Uh, then she went on to become um, um, district attorney, the DA for Gotham for a period of time, and then of course the um, 
Marvel, uh, the DC Universe uh, rebooted with the New 52, and we had Cedar Sense. So she's reintroduced into this. She is just introduced as a lawyer. Um, so I don't know if she's a company lawyer for the, for Gotham City or if she's just a lawyer who is that they've hired. Um, Precinct 13 has hired um, to kind of help them cover their ass because there is a further inquiry going on um, into them. Um, internal affairs is seemingly out to, is out gunning for them to take them down. Uh, that's the the storyline that's going to be going across the comics. This issue in particular had a haunting that they had to uh, solve and deal with, which is interesting. Um, and we get a little more conversation about the whole idea, the fact that that the specter is a walking, you know, nuclear bomb that can go off at any moment. And the reason that he is the reason that um, Jim Corrigan is doing the job that he's doing is because he needs to try and trop, stop and arrest and, and, um, um, bring justice to the sinners or the specter's going to bust out of him and he will do it. And when he does it, he does it on a, on a, you know, a nuclear option. He, he will just uh, annihilate everything. And of course they don't want that. Um, yeah. And a little more conversation about the other detective that's on the team who is basically kind of a, 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 ba a banshee. Um, she's a fae folk. She does not know that other than Corrigan telling her she was probably replaced at birth. Um, you know, put in the crib, the fairy folk put her in the crib and took the human child away. Um, but clearly every time she screams, somebody's going to die within a 24 hour period. So interesting to see how they're going to deal with, deal with that. And of course, deal with the fact that, um, internal affairs is coming to get them. But I still enjoy, I enjoyed the book. It's an interesting book. Um, this issue in particular wasn't like really gripping, but I think it's introducing some more stuff to us, um, that will, uh, complicate, uh, the lives of the characters going forward. Um, one more book I'm going to talk about, and then I'll look at the comments. My comment feeder on on the Google Hangout does not seem to work at all anymore. I don't know why that is. I, have, I need to look that up, clearly. And finally, I got issue number 41 of Batgirl, where um, you know basically Batgirl runs into the new Batman, uh, bunny-eared robot Batman, and then actually in this issue, um, Gordon, um, Jim Gordon, dad, shows up on her doorstep, minus the mustache, buzz cut, haircut. She kind of freaks out in the fact that dad needed the mustache. She, she harps on him quite a bit about that. That's some fun dialogue there of her harping on him about the fact that he really needs the mustache because he does not look like himself. Another the mustache, which I totally agree, I think is what everybody agrees with that. Um, but he also spills a big secret to her that he is the Batman now. Uh, and, and not only is he stopping crime, that, that the city has once again decided they're going to deal with the um, vigilantes that are out there because the vigilantes ultimately end up being just as dangerous as, as, um, as the villains themselves. Okay, I have a problem with that part of the storyline. It irritates me. We've been down that road. Batgirl, not very long ago in the Gail Simone run, we had dad versus Batgirl back then when he thought that, that Batgirl had, you know, had killed um, James Gordon Jr. And um, we kind of went down that road. It, it also doesn't make any sense because Jim Gordon has been a, a big um, on the side of Batman and and, and using justice in that sense and whatnot. So it doesn't make sense for, from that standpoint either, um, you know, to recreate this conflict that we, we just got, you know, we just got done with, we just got done with that conflict. Why, why would we be starting it over again? Um, I think even if the city decided that they needed to get rid of the vigilantes, I, I have not seen any written evidence that would show us a reason why Jim Gordon would suddenly decide once again, that it would be best to arrest the superheroes that are in the, you know, the, the street vigilantes that are in um, Gotham. It makes zero, makes zero sense for, for that to be happening. This is the only place that that storyline seems to be an actual storyline. Haven't seen it in Batman yet. Haven't seen it in detective yet. So I don't know if that'll end up being a storyline, but they're choosing to use it here. And I think that's unfortunate um, and unimaginative, I think um, to, to set up this, this conflict once again, between, um, between um, Barbara and her father. Um, 
whatever, find a different conflict. There's plenty of other ones you could have besides this one, I, I think. Um, there's a little bit of amusement in here. She's fighting some cultists that have kind of bring, brought up a cult that, that have to do with Oracle or the, the, the virus that thought she was Barbara Gordon. They're trying to bring it back. That part's somewhat amusing. It. Uh, art is interesting because now the art is completely done by, um, um, by Babs Tar. Uh, used to be the camera steward, did the breakdowns, and then and then um, um, uh, Barb Tar is going back over it and and you know putting her heart basically over the top of it. But the, so there's not the breakdowns in there. Um, so the art is more reflective of of Babs Tar. So it's even more her style, which I don't have a problem with. That's cool. It's its own look, and I like that and whatnot. I really was kind of looking forward. I actually ended up mostly enjoying. Um, this first arc from this creative team of, of Batgirl. Fundamentally huge change from what was before. I really liked what was before. Um, accepting this has just been kind of its own thing. Um, I actually was starting to enjoy it. I don't like the, the storyline that's starting out in this. If this is going to go on for very long, I'm going to find it pretty irritating unless they do something incredibly magical, which hasn't happened yet. Um, I don't know. I'm on the fence as to dropping this just because this isn't an interesting storyline to me. It, it, it's been done. It was done very recently. Why, why are we going over it again? You know, love to hear somebody else's thoughts that might be reading the book. I don't know how many people I know. Uh, Reader 1717 is still reading Batgirl. I don't know how many other people are still reading Batgirl because I know a lot of people jumped off where they, because they were not happy with the whole, uh, the radical change in the, in the character. So let's look at comments. See if I can pull them up here on my phone. So Ryan C is saying that he wished that Luke was on uh, <laughs> because he'd love to hear his thoughts on the We Are Robin because uh, right because Ryan C thought it was pretty good. And that's cool. I think Luke really liked it too. Um, Luke, Luke was really chomping at the bit to have been on tonight's show uh, because I think he really enjoyed that. I know you really enjoyed um, Gotham Midnight too. And um, would have loved to have him here to talk about it so we could have a conversation about what he liked about it versus what I didn't necessarily care or think was that special about it. Um, yeah, I mean, there are lots of people who aren't reading Grace and clearly Ryan C, but um, it seems like I don't know anybody who dropped Grayson. Those people who've gotten on Grayson to read it, I don't know of anyone who's dropped it. Um, so for, for whatever that's worth, I don't, you know, I, um, yeah. So I, I think it's a strong book. It's a strong book. It, it's the, the Janet art is awesome on it. And it's just kind of enjoyable. So um, DC news. Let me think. I can't think of anything. Can't think of anything DC news wise. Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Can't think of anything. So if anybody has some, oh my gosh, you missed this about DC news. Let me know. Let me know in the comments because I can't remember anything that happened in this last week that was um, pertinent to DC and what DC's got going on um, currently. One more week. We've got one more week of, or was this the last week? Is this considered the last week of um of DC books? I guess it was. Really, technically, this was the last of the fur of of um, the month of June's books. Um, so. Of the number ones that I read, I enjoyed most of them. Um, Prez came out this week. Did anybody out there read Prez? Um, love to hear your guys' thoughts on Prez. I haven't watched anybody's videos yet because I just finished reading my books. So I'll be going and checking out people's videos and what they have to say about uh, the books that came out this week. Curious what people have to say about Prez. Um, I didn't get it. Now I'm wondering if I should have went and got it. Um, it sounds like it might have been pretty cool. And... Um, I guess the reason I didn't pick it up is that was going to be more of kind of a gag kind of a thing. And it was going to be, I knew it was going to be 12 issues and I'm not sure that you can do how long you can pull a gag off for 12 issues. I say that, but then I read, I read justice league 3000 and it's kind of a, I mean, it has real stuff going on it, but at the same time it it's, it's done tongue and cheekedly. So I don't know why I feel like that. I, I get nervous. I love comedy. I like to laugh, but I get nervous when it comes to funny comic books. Um, 
because I don't know. I think I think comedy is hard to do, and um, so I don't think it always is successful as far as that kind of thing goes. So, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, the animator. I'm not sure what your question is. You're asking me what is the planet, and I'm not sure what planet. Oh, planet Earth. Are we talking about Justice League 3000 and one? It's Earth, but I don't know that it's. I can't remember what they call it. They call it something else right now, but it, it technically is Earth. If that's what your question has to do with, so I'm not sure. If that's what your question is. The animator is using the Google Q and A off the Google Plus pitch. Have to remember to check that thing because the patient will use it. Okay, so let's talk independent books because clearly that's you know mostly what I read. It seems like anymore. Um, just lots of great independent books out there. Let's start right out with um, Grant Morrison's Annihilator, issue number six. A uh, few months behind, but well worth the wait, in my opinion. Um, this was this concludes Annihilator. Um, it does leave at the very end. It does leave the door open to another book if they were to want to do that um i would be excited for another book i love these characters that are in this um by the time this whole thing is said done and finished to some degree i will go back to saying i still feel like it it has some very philip k dick um aspects to it um the i'm not sure the characters aren't sure what what is real and what is their own hallucinations or what's been influenced them by something from space um i really like there's some character is, is developments in this that I, I like also the art continues to be amazing fraser irving does a great great job great job um grant morrison and fraser irving are a great team together they did some great stuff um back on some early batman and robin stuff too as far as them working together um you know, the, the elements that the, the universe is created by this Max No Max character um, that um, um, our main character space has maybe created or has just been influenced by a data pack that's been smashed into his brain that's the equivalent of him having terminal cancer. Um, yeah, there's just some good elements in here. There's some, you know, there's some... Um, um, character development in the sense that um um space and his you know ex-girlfriend um kind of bury the hatchet on some things and settle some stuff and come to kind of some understanding with each other which i thought was really good um just really really um enjoyed the heck out of out of the book um you know despite the weight on that just awesome 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 stuff um and if there is a if there is a a sequel to this i will um definitely pick it up um, like i said it does end with that kind of a of a feel i said i just love the fraser irving art all these crazy faces this is where he's struggling he's struggling to um fight back dying of brain cancer his nose is bleeding as he's trying to explain to max no max basically how he's kind of a pathetic um you know how he's kind of a pathetic human being and whatnot his girlfriend ex-girlfriend is awesome as she kind of talks her way acts her way out of getting her getting her own head blown off and and stuff um yeah just some just some just some brilliant stuff so just really really kind of cool and you know some cool funky uh morrison kind of things which always always good in my opinion um what other indie books do i want to talk about let's well i mentioned it before so let's talk about um suiciders this is issue number five um great cover there such an awesome job of making that tattoo on his wrist look like a tattoo um while also being a piece of art in and of itself Great stuff. We get kind of uh, more back history on the saint, where he came from, his way of working himself up to uh, becoming the saint and being on the um, gentrified side of the wall that separates the two halves of of L.A. or L.A. versus New L.A. Um, and 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 that sort of thing, which is really cool. Plus, 
things get, are getting really serious with the Saint. Clearly, the manager who basically set him up to, to fail in the fight is still going to try and um, tie up this loose end that is the Saint wandering around and sends goons out to get him. Um, so curious to see where that goes to. Plus our our paparazzi guy who has all the information is on the run and it looks like he is hiring a coyote to get himself back across the border and get out of new LA and get into new LA. So he can hopefully protect himself from the guys that are trying to silence him, which clearly means that it's really bad if he's willing to risk um, LA because LA is a pretty ugly and seedy place. Of course continues to be um, brilliant, brilliant art by um, Brugero. Um, great colors by Hollingsworth. Um, I'm still just really enjoying the book. It's got enough stuff going on that I think is interesting. Um, I like seeing this this history of of where the saint came from. I think it's pretty cool. And um, uh, yeah, the like I said, the art's amazing in it. The tones, the colors of it, all all really good stuff. Let's see here. Click on my prize came out last week, says Christina. Picked it up on a whim. It was really impressed with it. I love the way these are social media. If you could track it down, give it a shot. Okay, so I'll go hunt, I'll go hunt that down. Um, so Ryan C wasn't blown away by Annihilator. And I wasn't blown away by by number six either. Uh, but I I like the ending of it. I thought the ending was fine. Just like you're saying that you, you that was a satisfactory conclusion. And if they run with another one, you're definitely gonna pick it up. Awesome. Same here. Um, I almost never like the ending of books, though. It seems maybe I just don't like things to end. I don't know. Hard to hard to land an ending on a book. I think so. Yeah. But anyway, enjoying it. Let's see here. Um. Um, let's see. Talk books that Christina didn't get. I know you didn't get this, Christina, so I don't like talk about it briefly. I won't talk in any detail, so I don't wreck anything because I know you're out there watching right now. Um, Effigy, this is issue number um six, basically end of the first arc. Um, I'm really enjoying the hell out of this book. I love the main character, um uh, uh Condra. She is just an interesting character. Uh, I love, there's always scenes where she kind of talks to us um, like she's in therapy or she's talking to her diary or something like that, which is always really fascinating. I, I love those aspects of the story. The story of itself is is interesting and it's basically taking a really crazy twist. Um, I love the fact that in this issue, she talks about the types of therapy that she went through. And um, one of the therapies she's doing is narrative therapy where you basically re rewrite or write your life how you want it to be and then attempt as best as you can to come to your to your narrative and so she has this narrative that you know she's uh, you know that after the whole tv show kid thing she leaves that behind her she becomes a productive policeman you know she gets married to some wonderful prince charming has a child they live happily ever after and blah blah, blah. but clearly that ends up not being her narrative someone else is writing the narrative for her and she needs to figure out how to get back to writing that um, kind of a thing. Love this cover. Art inside is solid. Um, I think most of the effigy, which one of the things I like about the cover is, instead of having a a you know a title that's always on the book in kind of the same the same font, same style, effigy is in the same font, but it's always incorporated into the title as opposed to being a something they stuck on after the fact. So I really like that about the covers. Um, the next arc of this thing is going to be, I mean, not complete. Well, it's going to be awfully different um, by the end of this thing. Um, so really curious to see what the next arc looks like. I don't know how many people actually read this book. Well, I know a, a couple people that do, but I've discovered that just because we read it doesn't mean the mass, the mass majority of people read some of the stuff that we're reading. So I don't know what kind of sales this book has. I don't know how strong. I'm hoping that, you know, first trade's coming out. That they'll be strong. That Vertigo's still going with their model of maybe our maybe our singles won't sell as well, but our trades are going to sell well. And so, you know, we keep producing the book. So hopefully it stays around. I, I just love the characters in it. I love Eddie. There's a you know a you know transgender character is pretty significant in this. Um, Eddie, who is is pretty awesome, childhood friend of 
our main character. Uh, you know, I, I like the, there's a detective in this that I like also. It's just, it's interesting. It's just got enough kind of odd stuff going on. Yeah, it's got some verging on space alien stuff almost. Um, some, some hypnosis kind of strange stuff that I'm not sure exactly how that's all going to play out that I'm really curious for the next arc. Like we're going to get into that, which that's going to be cool. Um, so yeah, looking forward to reading more of that. Really been in, enjoying that. Um, um, more and more, the issues are more and more surprising, more and more enjoyable as it goes along, I think. Um, let's talk, let's talk mythic issue number two. I actually enjoyed Mythic issue number two a lot more than I did issue number one. Issue number one was kind of like, it had some amusing aspects to it, but it was kind of like, you know, okay, I'm not sure this is really going to be. Um, this issue is drawing a bigger a bigger story, uh, a grander thing than just, you know, some people who have some paranormal powers, uh, you know, playing janitor to um, the mythical world, as it were. Um, something disastrous has happened. The organization that runs... Um, that runs mythic is kind of like under attack. Um, and our, our main team is like the last team that's left. They're being called back to home base to see if they can scramble and fix whatever's going on. Um, there's big giant demons in this. Um, they're the, one of the characters in the main group has an alter ego who is a demon shaman who is called kills enemies. Who's hilarious. He, he, his head isn't attached to his body. He holds it with a hair and swings it around like a war mace and throws it at stuff, which is all kinds of fun and goofy. Um, and then there's some greater evil plot that's going on that we'll be curious to see in here. A creepy girl with a flashlight. Um, that, that's some interesting stuff in it also. Um, yeah, um, enjoyable second issue. Like I said, the, the second issue made it much more lively and um, gives us an idea of, at least what the first arc is going to be about. Um, so kind of curious to see what that is. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of BPRD in the fact that they, some of them have powers and they fight other mythical stuff and whatnot, but it's, it's more for color. It's more grand on, on a grander scale, kind of all the time. It's more in your face, more for color superhero-ish than what BPRD is, where BPRD seem, is much more of a kind of dark, um, menacing thing. You know, there's creatures that you shouldn't name, and and you don't see a lot of them, you don't see a lot of them, and then all of a sudden it explodes, and there's tentacles everywhere kind of a thing. Uh, this is much more in your face. It's much more vulgar, not as in language, but just as in the monsters that show up or whatever are huge and extreme. Um, so, yeah. But cool. But cool. Definitely been... Um, enjoying it. Um, Southern Cross. I still don't know what I think of this book. Love the cover. Of course, Becky Cullen cover. Uh, Clinton doing the writing on it. Um, Andy Berger doing, uh, B. Langner doing the, um, the art and um, uh, Lou Ridge doing wonderful colors on it. Um, clearly some crazy stuff going on here. Uh, there's some smuggling going on in the story. Our main character, Birth, is trying to figure all that out. Uh, there's a gravity drive that runs the ship, that runs the spaceship they're on. It's gone wonky, and it seems like in the process of it going wonky, it messes with you physically, psychologically. Um, so there's some potential hallucination going on in here. Um, not sure how much of it has to do with ghosts and whatnot. There's not a completely clear answer, which is fine. Um, but I just feel like the book quite doesn't go someplace. And I'm hanging on to it. A little longer because I keep hearing people talk about because I didn't hang with um, Gotham Academy, which is another book that that Becky Clunan was writing. It takes a little longer for her books to take off, so I want to give it a shot because um, I think I like the premise of the book, but it's still just not quite gripping me. It's not it's not doing something that I want it to do, and and so you know, I read it, but I don't care. Um, and I read it hoping that something's going to be cool. And there's elements about it that are cool, but it's like, it's just not quite coming together yet. So I don't know how many more issues I'm going to hang on for. As a matter of fact, when I did my order for this month, I'm not sure I actually ordered this book. I may have dropped it. I'll have to go back and look and see, but I just not quite 
have something that I want it to have. Um, yeah, which is unfortunate because, um, like I said, I, I want to like it. I like the creators. Just, um, yeah, not quite, not quite have the bite that I wanted it to have. Material. Um, how many people are reading material? I, I know that Christina is. I, I believe Ryan C is. At least he read the first issue. Uh, this is a pretty heavy, um, heavy book. It clearly has an agenda to attempt to make the readers think. Uh, written by um, Alex Cotton. I think a lot of his stuff. I, I'm deciding it is kind of that way. It's 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 here to challenge you. It's here to challenge your ideals in some fashion or another. And this book is definitely that way. Um, we continue on with our kind of seemingly four um, main characters and their storylines that are going on. A professor who um, in this issue talks about, comic creators to some degree, talks about Jack Kirby, which is kind of interesting. Um, and, um, and, and how consumerism can destroy art and, and that sort of stuff. Um, we continue to have our element with our uh, Guantanamo Bay um, um, survivor um, who was tortured and stuff like that, and and he, and his experiences um, and, and what he's trying to go through. Our um, uh, young um, African American uh, man who's basically just living a typical life that a typical person would live, um, and I think how does that fold into the horrible stuff that's either going to happen to him soon or what's happening to him now as he's kind of being pressured into um, um, you know, doing some stuff that he doesn't want to do by the police. And um, and we also have our actress who's just trying to live her life and trying to figure out how to make this movie with this, with this um, producer, director, um, and some conversations about collaboration and, and what does it take to collaborate and, and that sort of stuff. All interesting things all coupled with a interesting um, um, essay in the back about um, about torture, about the CIA in the United States using the um, um, what I'm drawing a blank on what it's called something rendition torturing people basically um, interesting essay in the back on that and. Um, Lots of stuff in the book that has that has um, like little footnotes to tell you other stuff to read to make you aware of other things that are that are there and whatnot. During the um, African American parts, it continues to be well. We're I mean, he's just living his life, eating his you know, making gumbo and stuff like that, and playing video games. You know, and all along the bottom, there are lists of names. If you Google any of these names, it's all. Um, African American people in the United States that have been either killed or beaten or that sort of thing um, by the police. Um, there's there's references here to songs, you know, like a playlist. Play this song for this part. Play this song when you're doing this part, which is all interesting. I don't know if the artwork is super strong. The coloring is kind of strange. Um, reminds me of the coloring in another book that Alex Cott does, which is. Um, um, Change, which is a real kind of a head trip of a book also. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. I'm going to continue to read it because um, I, I, I'm interested in seeing what he has to say and what kind of a message he's delivering. But clearly it has an agenda you know, of some sort to uh, pressure us into thinking in, 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 in some way. Not to necessarily think in a way, but to think, I think, is largely what the agenda is. But... We'll, we'll see going forward, and I'm sure to paint on what your um, what your own political um, predications are would de will determine how, how you see the book and what the agenda is and what they're trying to tell us and that sort of thing, I'm sure. So uh, I'm sure there's plenty of reviews out there that will look at this book in a number of different a number of different ways to paint on where you fall on the left to right to center scale of politics. Um, regardless of what country you live in, I think. Um, Trying to think if I know of anybody outside of the United States that's, I can't think of anybody offhand that I've seen videos of that talk about, that talk about the book. So I don't know, I don't know how this plays 
outside of the United States? Because there's clearly aspects that have nothing to do with the United, United States in particular, I don't think. I'm the professor and, and what's going on with him um, and he's kind of questioning his philosophy in the world clearly isn't tied directly to the United States. Um, the actress stuff isn't clearly isn't tied directly to the United States too. Torture stuff kind of is clearly the stuff with the African-American um, kid is tied directly to the United States. But if you deal in racism wherever you're at, and I don't know of any place that, that, that doesn't have some aspect of racism. So it might still, it might still play um, in, in some way <laughs> to you if you aren't in the United States and, and, are, and are reading the book. And if you are in the United States and you're reading the book, what do you think of it? Let me know in the comments or send me a message or whatever, because I'd be curious to see if there's somebody outside the United States is reading it and how does it play? Is it play differently for somebody who's not in the United States? Um, quickly, Alien Resident, um, the Sam Hain mystery. This is issue number um, two of three. Um, just a, it's just a fun kind of a little murder mystery, a, a savvy murder she wrote maybe is what it is, where the main character is an alien instead of a mystery writer. Um, it, I don't know. I just, I just feel like it. The artwork is really strong. Um, the art is by Steve, um, uh, Parkhouse. Just really like his, um, really like his art, um, in the book. It's just been kind of a fun, different, you know, kind of a read. And, um, we continue on with this mystery of him trying to figure out, he's got this manuscript trying to figure out is the manuscript real? Cause the manuscript feels very autobiographical about a woman and a man who are in love and they end up killing somebody that attacks them and did they had the body in a garden somewhere that sort of thing or is it all just fiction um so interesting stuff uh, enjoyable um something that picked up dramatically in my opinion this is issue number four of uh frankenstein underground it's like this issue it's like we suddenly went from having just kind of pretty pictures and some you know interesting scenery kind of a thing to, oh, hey, we, we need to actually have a story and a purpose to why Frankenstein is underground and what's going on. And this issue, um, um, Mike Mignola decided to deliver that to us. Um, it's very interesting. We kind of a quick slice of history about the people that are living in this underground space, uh, what's going on, uh, the powers that be, the powers that are trying to take over and the powers that are trying to keep a hold of what's going on there. And Frankenstein suddenly has a purpose other than just being drug around um, for the last three issues. So I really enjoyed this issue story-wise. And of course, the art by Ben Steinbeck tends to be gorgeous stuff. Ben Steinbeck's a great artist. Um, so uh, I enjoyed number four a lot more than than issue one to three. I like those, but um, like I, I feel like a lot of stuff that Mignola writes by himself, um, it was lacking um, some story elements that I think were needed. Here, here we here we get those story elements, and and I think it, uh, it goes to show also kind of why um, Mike Mignola has brilliant ideas, and I you know that to, uh, to tell for really interesting stories, and characters, and that sort of thing. But he kind of needs that other writer that's there along with them to make sure those other parts of the writing chops get get addressed. I think um, so. I always think he's stronger when he has another writer along with him than when he's by himself. But like I said. Really enjoyed issue four. Really, really stepped up a bunch. Um, Invisible Republic. This is issue number four. Still really enjoying this uh, book. Um, wonderful artwork by um, uh, Gabriel Hardman. Uh, interesting story by him and um, uh, his, his other half, uh, Karina uh, Bechko. Um, Jordan Boyd doing colors on the book. Um, just building up more layers of this greater story um, in in this issue. It, you know, it, it has more to do with um, the um, um, cousin who is um, writing the memoir, um, how she's established herself, what she's doing, that sort of thing. And and our um, our journalist gets a gets a partner um, basically helping him along the way now. Um, so there's gonna be some more dynamics there, which I think will be interesting. Um, this is just building up layers and layers of story. Um, not necessarily anything huge, significant and mind blowing in this issue, but really solid, um, really interesting. Um, it, it, it is 
they're looking as creators are looking about 30 issues is what they want to go with the book. You know, this is issue four. Um, so this is just, like I said, just building up a, a to give us a baseline of what it is. So then we can, I think we can start really going to town, um, but still really enjoying it. Um, I think it's uh, um, a really interesting book. This issue in particular wasn't gripping, uh, but still interesting to get these, the little stuff that's going to make this larger picture, I think is gonna just be an awesome. Cause when the book is really good, it's really good. So excited to see the next layers get added um, for that stuff. And you drink. And finally, the fade out issue number seven, another book I won't talk a whole about, about a whole bunch. Um, Cause there's some people watching that haven't read this issue yet. Um, issue number seven, wonderful continues wonderful the art is amazing in this um this book's got a lot of whoo um a lot of um yeah nakedness and having fun in it. a lot of adult a lot of adult fun um yeah um which is interesting it was interesting that whole aspect of it whatnot clearly more to this relationship than what i thought you know, last issue when there was a kind of kiss and they briefly slept together, I was like, oh man, this is just going to be kind of, a, a, you know, maybe, maybe um, Ed Brubaker kind of stumbled on kind of a, kind of a stupid cliche-ish kind of a thing. Seems to be way more than that though. So that, that's cool. Um, I like that aspect of it. Um, uh, you know, our, our writer here, Charlie, gets a moment of, of relief kind of, maybe almost forgets about what this how this whole story started for us and whatnot then gets quickly pulled back into that um back into you know the greater concerns the greater what is going on um so yeah i'm just really enjoying that um you know we get some more aspects with our our um male actor who of course had crashed a vehicle um, kind of in protest of the fact that he isn't allowed to live his own life um, because he's gay in the 1940s as a hunky movie star. Uh, does not work really well. So there's some aspects of that that were more addressed in this, which I thought were great. Um, but mostly this had to do with Charlie in, in relationship uh, with Mira here. And um, Mira, is that her name? Now that I've said that, I'm not sure that's right. Um, Man, yeah, yeah, the cast of characters. Um, but, um, but anyway, really good stuff. Really, um, the art continues to be amazing in it, as I've already said. And um, just a slow, interesting build. Um, see the different bits and pieces ticking together and, and forming this larger story uh, and, and kind of yeah, as these people get entwined with each other and what's that going to mean and whatnot. Um, I just, like I said, I just, it's, it's a, it's a great, a great book, a great book. Um, this kind of slow simmering build of, of, uh, of what's going on and, and what's going on in it and, and what the characters mean to each other and those different aspects. And there's some other sinister stuff going on in the background that you're not exactly sure what it is. Uh, you're not sure how much of it is the characters be paranoid or what they should legitimately be worried about, um, which all makes for intriguing stuff for us to sit around and think about as we read it and whatnot. So great stuff there. Uh, let me look at comments real quick. Yeah, Ryan C is saying he likes Effigy too, top of his list for things, so. Oh, we'll see. Tom Ray's reading Effigy too and liking it. Good, good. I'm glad there's more people reading it than um, than what I thought. Let's see. Sales in Effigy are around 6,000, which isn't too hot. But the um, incoming Virgo team is behind it and Suiciders, which is selling around 8,000. Pretty solid, they seem to feel. Yeah, you know, I think that, um, I think a lot of Virgo books only sell around that. Then it comes down to, it comes down to, the trade sales and the trade sales are 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 doing well than it than it does well. Um, okay, I'm gonna see if I can read the comments on my actual 
the video because I can only read half of people's comments and I feel like I'm leaving something out. So uh, let's see here. If I can get down to... Uh, reading and love and material, love the interjection of creators' rights issues in the second issue. Yeah, um, yeah. Read the essays. You definitely want to read the essays. The essays are um, um, are, are very good in it. And Ryan's saying that that Cot is um, has a lot of guts to be overtly political. Uh, you know that he wishes more character creators would follow lead. I agree and, and don't agree. It depends on what they're writing. Um, I would love to see more political pieces. Um, in comics, for sure, um, for sure, I think that that comics is a um, uh, um, um, you know I, I think it's a good medium to to uh, explore that sort of stuff. Um, but I don't know that I want I don't want heavily I don't want I know I want everything heavily you know you know politicized um, along the way. So um, yeah. Um, so Ryan didn't like the, um, Phillips illustrations during the sex scenes for, um, the fade out. Uh, they were almost comically bad. The rest of the book looked great. Um, but those panels in particular sequences were almost painfully awkward. You know what? I almost, I, I agree in a sense that they're that way, but they almost, to me, they almost fit in the sense of if you're, if you were watching a noir, which of course I feel like the fade out is a noir. If you were watching a noir that was made during the era the noirs first came out, and they were allowed to put that sort of stuff actually on in the movie and on the screen, I just feel like that they would be portrayed in that fashion, that they would be portrayed in that kind of awkwardness. I mean, the whole running the beach thing to me seems strange, didn't it to you? You 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 know, the thing has all had this kind of this kind of seediness and this tone to us. And even the beginning of this book starts out that way with this kind of seedy tone. And you flip the page and suddenly we're on this kind of, you know, bright beach that's, I, I thought it was a dream sequence to tell you the truth when I first started reading it until you got a little ways into it. So I don't know. I, I don't have a problem with those, with those, um, those sex scenes in it because it, to me, it almost feels like it matches what the visual would be for a noir kind of a thing. It, it, there's something about it. That doesn't bother me because of that. Um, around, around on that. So, so yeah, <laughs> I guess as as far as far as that goes, I think it, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's okay. I think I think it works. Um, so, still really enjoying the book. And that's my books. Um, a reasonable week for me. I don't know what comes out next week. Um, I guess I could take a look here. Real quick, let me see if I can find the comic list is what I use to look to see what books are coming out. We'll see what's coming out the 1st of July that I might be excited about. Um, or other people might be excited about, I guess, for that matter. Let's see here. Hmm. Um, so Boom Studios, um, Spire number one, um, uh, comes out next week. Are people getting Spire? I neglected to, um, to get it because I was a bit apprehensive because I wasn't excited with the way that, um, um, Six Gun Gorilla ended up ending. And I think this is done by basically the same people who did that. Right. Um, but I know a lot of people have been, um, uh, I've seen lots of, reviewers talking about it that have gotten to do um, re advanced reviews on it. Now, when I say reviewers, I'm not talking about me or you who are just kind of giving our opinions on stuff. I'm talking about the, you know, the quasi paid sites, the, the um, comic book resources and the newsarama type places and whatnot. So I don't know, that could be an interesting book. I'm curious if anybody's picking that up. I may end up trying to hunt that down. Um, probably will if people start talking about being really good along the way. So let's see what else. Um, issue number five of Neverboy comes out. Looking forward to that. That has been fun. Next issue of Baltimore, the Cult of the Red King also comes out next week. 
DC books. What are we going to get for DC books? Let's see. That I will be getting next issue of Bizarro's out. Next Detective Comics is out. Um, next FBP is out. Um, or Green Arrow, of course. Second issue of Midnighter. Curious to see how that stands up to the first issue. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, Will Eisner's The Spirit comes out for Dynamite next week. I don't know if anybody's interested in that or not. I like the old Spirit stuff, but I don't know that I'm interested in a a um, that coming back. I just don't know that I'm excited about that. Um, Graphic India, Grant Morrison's 18 Days, number one, comes out. I'm not getting that because, of course, I don't know that I knew about it to order it. Be curious to see if somebody picks that up and reads it. Because I have no graphic India. I'm not even familiar with um It's a dollar. First issue is a dollar. Not, not familiar with that company at all. Um, Let's see. What's coming out from Image? Eight House number one comes out. Definitely be picking that up. Airboy number two. Super excited for Airboy number two. Airboy number one was just awesome. So looking forward to seeing what that's going to be like. Um, get another issue of Deadly Class. What other books am I picking up by them? Is that it? Wicked and Divine comes out also. So... Yeah. Marvel, we get that second issue of A-Force comes out. Number two comes out. Ah, I picked up number one. Wasn't super excited. Liked the idea of it, but I don't know. I'm going to have to hear people talk about that before I decide I'm going to pick that up. Um, I think we get the Red Skull. Red Skull number one, I think, comes out that week. Halfway through Secret Wars with Secret Wars number four being out. What else? Unbeatable Squirrel Girls out. I know a lot of people like that. Years of Future Past number two comes out. I don't know what people are thinking about that. <sighs> Only Press Bunker number 12 comes out. So there's going to be some decent comics coming out next week. Won't Probably won't be a very big week for me, though, just kind of looking over that. But, um, yeah. Should be fun. Well, I don't know that I have a whole lot else to talk about. With um, no one else here to bounce things off of. I don't know. Um, don't have a lot else to talk about. So, um, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna end it early. I'm gonna end it early, and um, I'll be around for a little bit. If people are still commenting, I'll comment back in the comments. Um. Thanks for tuning in. Next week, I don't know if we're having a comic book roundtable. If we do have a comic book roundtable, I'm guessing that it is going to be on Friday because, um, as I said, kind of at the beginning of the show, uh, Saturday is a holiday here in the States, and um, I'm, I'm sure I'll be doing something with the family as opposed to um, being here talking comic books. So hopefully, my fingers crossed, I get my comic books nice and early on Friday morning when I get my comics in the mail, and I can get a few of those comics read. Um, so we can talk about them Friday night. Um, or maybe Friday will be a free-for-all if I don't get books read or whatever. Or the people I, the people that make the show can talk books and I'll talk about the ones I've read and clearly we'll talk about whatever else. So, um, yeah, that um, being said, uh, thank you all of you for tuning in and watching tonight, even though it wasn't that exciting because you're just listening to me blather on for an hour. Um but um, I appreciate it. Anybody who tunes in after the fact, appreciate you being here and uh, listening to me talk. As always, if you want to actually be on the show, just, just drop me a message and uh, let me know you to be on the show. And uh, more than likely, you can be. Um, I don't have too many rules for being on the show or not being on the show. Basically, um, be polite, be cordial, and um, have read some comic books, basically. Um, yeah, that being said... Um, have a great night, everybody, and I'll see you next week, I'm sure.
in, in one way or another. I'll, I'll be around. Have a good one, everybody.